Hey, everybody. I'm Ashley Rowley. First of all, thank you all for spending your evening with us. Um, Jess and Jamie, thank you, the Alliance. Thank you for asking me to host this webinar tonight. I was really excited when Jamie reached out since February is catching month uh, and asked me if I'd like to provide any instruction. And it's an overwhelming yes. And the reason it's an overwhelming yes is because throughout my career, and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself, so you know that I'm not just some random person sitting here teaching you how to catch, but is I didn't learn the intricacies of the position until I got to college. So I was an athlete that I was just a really good athlete. My older brother was a catcher and I tried to keep up with him. But when it comes to the finer details of the position, I was never taught that. Um, so fun story and fun fact. So I played at the University of Florida my first week on campus uh, in practice we're throwing, we're warming up and coach comes up to me and says, uh, Ash, you have side spin on your throw. And I said, yes, ma'am. Didn't know that was a thing. And, and she said, no catcher of mine will have side spin. And she took the ball out of my hand and she gave me a spinner and said, you'll throw with this until the side spin's gone. And it took me eight weeks. So something that I would have loved to know when I was 10 or 12 growing up. And it's really a detail that I reinforce with the catchers that I train right now are those minute details within our position. Uh, if we think about catching, we know we don't have a lot of time to react. I mean, we're talking a, a pop time at the division one level is 1.6 seconds. So in 1.6 seconds, that's not a lot of time for movement. So we really have to be intentional about refining our skills. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm going to go ahead and share. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So and I'm going to pull up my presentation for you. All right. We are going to talk about the catcher's warm up. Now, the catcher's warm up is something that I learned in college, but it's a tool and it's a it's an everyday daily tool. Uh oh, there we go. Everybody hear me? Okay. Hopefully. Okay. So it's a it's a tool that I use every day with my catchers, whether it's in lessons, whether it's coaching high school, whether it's coaching club ball. Consider the catchers warm up the dailies or the everyday drills, the pregame drills that you're going to do with your infielders and outfielders. There's a lot of times. Well, let me tell you more about myself before I get going. Bye, guys. Um, I played for the University of Florida. I was a catcher there from 2001 to 2005. I was a team captain, and I'm currently, I think, in the top five for single season and career fielding percentage records. Uh, high school, I'm born and raised from Colorado, was fortunate enough to win a state championship and win the Gold Glove Award. Um, as a coach and a professional, I am the founder and CEO of Colorado Softball Academy. Colorado Softball Academy is a full circle player development academy that we opened in August of 2022 in Loveland, Colorado. Um, I started the Colorado Softball Academy Foundation. Uh, with hopes, one, to provide high quality experiences to girls in our sport, uh, to provide scholarship opportunities for kids so uh, finances are not a barrier to play, um, and to also provide for, uh, free mental health uh, resources for athletes who need it at no cost to them. I was recently appointed the president of the Colorado USA Softball Chapter Board of Directors. I don't know how I got myself roped into that one, but I somehow did. Um, and I've been on the advisory board for the Rocky Mountain Fast Pitch League, the RMFL. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be a graduate assistant uh, coach at the University of Tennessee. I was there when Monica Abbott and Shannon Depking were there and was part of the regional coaching staff of the year and part of the team that we were a second place runner up finish to the Women's College World Series at the Women's College World Series to Arizona. So I've been doing this for what feels like 100 years, whether it's coaching teams, playing the game. Uh, or doing private lessons, and it's uh, it's a passion of mine, no doubt. All right, catchers, we are the hardest working, most underappreciated, and most often the most underpracticed position on the field. There are so many times that I get asked from coaches, uh, what do I do with my catchers? Or do you have some drills I can do with my catchers? Or I'll ask my catchers when they come in for lessons, Hey, are you getting to work on your throwdowns in practice? Are you getting to work on blocking in practice? And a lot of times the answer is no, because simply if you haven't played that position, then you, it's just, it's hard to understand what to do. And it's hard to understand how to teach it many times. And oftentimes catchers in practice, their practice consists of catching pitchers, bullpens or catching in fungo for uh, infield and outfield team defense and very little they get to work on their glove transfers or their footwork with blocking or their footwork um, and body positioning when they're framing. So this is a really important, I call it the catcher's warm up, but consider this, like I said, the dailies. 
catchers who are uh, listening right now, athletes, there is never going to be a time in your career when you're too good to do the little drills. Okay. You look at college athletes and they're still going to do their glove work, right? You look at your innies and outies and they're doing drop steps and they're working short, hand, short hops or bare hands. They're rolling balls to each other. Uh, you're never not going to hit off a tee, right? So throughout your career, you always have to have a regular focus on the details because the details are what set you up for success in the long term. And that's what's really responsible for allowing those big dog skills to fall into place, right? Our glove transfer. If we can refine that glove transfer, then we're going to, that's going to lead to that one six pop time. But these are the drills that you are going to do that you should do at least every day before practice and every pregame is this catcher's warm up. So what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you through what the catcher's warm up is. And I'm going to give you a little bit of instruction behind each drill and each skill to make sure that you you have a good basis and a good foundation to, to look for. Right. I mean, I could say, OK, coaches, I want you to do five squares with framing and you're going to go great. You know, tell your athlete. All right. Do five squares. But do you know what you're looking for? right? Are they doing the proper repetitions? So they're reinforcing quality muscle memory. Okay. So here's a little fun fact for you. Research shows that it takes 66 days of constant and consistent repetition for a newly learned skill to become muscle memory, to become a habit, right? So if you learn something new today, whether it's framing, blocking, glove transfers, or you're going to do your catcher's warm up, and you've got something that you're trying to refine, which all of us do, okay? You need to do that consistently for 66 days before your body recognizes that at muscle, as muscle memory to where now you can perform that skill without constantly having to think about what you're doing, okay? So the catcher's warm up, it consists of framing, blocking, and glove transfers, okay? So when you warm up in practice or you warm up in a game, okay, you're gonna do your dynamic warm up with your team. You're gonna do your plyometrics, you're gonna do your laps, you're gonna stretch, you're gonna do all that piece. And then you're gonna throw long toss. Now, I encourage catchers to warm up with catchers. And PS, always throw catchers with your shin guards on. It's a, it's kind of a badge of honor thing, but put your, put your shins on when you warm up. But you're gonna play long toss, okay? Long toss is a key to building arm strength and velocity, overhand throwing velocity in your throw. And when I say long toss, I'm not talking about, you know, if you're on the left field foul line, not just going past second base. Okay. I'm talking 180 feet. So imagine playing catch with your teammate from home plate to center field every single day. That's what long toss is, right? So you don't have to throw bullets, but air it out. Okay, make sure that your body, that you're engaging your legs, you're engaging your glove pull, you're following through on your throw. That's where we start to build that overhand throwing velocity, okay? After you do those reps, when your infielders are going to partner up and do their, their, uh, their glove work, your outies are going to do their over the shoulders. This is when catchers pair up to do the catcher's warm up, okay? You're going to get about, oh, five to 10 feet apart. You're not very far apart. And your, your partner is going to front toss to you, okay? So let's go to this next drill. It's going to start with framing, all right? So if I'm talking five squares, think about our strike zone as a picture frame, right? Hence the word framing. And think about each point in that square as the point that you want to hit, as what we're really refining our, our uh, framing mechanics, right? So five squares, I always start my catchers with low and in. Then we move to low and out. Then we go up and out and then we move up and in and we do that five times. OK, so this is one of my college athletes that I put it on mute because her and I were just chit chatting as we were going through her warm up. But you're going to see as Alex is moving through the framing part of her five squares. OK, now she's using a brand new training glove that's a little bit stiff. You notice that glove is pretty small. But what she's doing is warming up her footwork. It's a step shift. She sees the ball in. She makes sure her, she makes sure her nose is behind the ball, okay? And she's going to stick that pitch. But what we're going to do is we're going to go five times through her uh, her framing portion here. Now I'm talking to her a little bit about her receiving on that inside pitch, which we'll uh, we'll talk about here in a minute. But we're going to make sure we hit every single part of that strike zone of that picture frame when we're working our warmups. Okay. So a lot of times catchers, the hardest part is front tossing. Um, now you can do this where if both of you do your frames, 
right? So one catcher does their frames and then you can switch or you can iron woman it and go your frames to your blocking, to your glove turn, and then you can switch, okay? All right. So what I want to do now is I'm hoping, Jess, let me know if you can hear this on your end, okay? Hey, catchers. You hear this? Yep, we can hear it. Excellent. So I'm going to do a little bit of an instructional breakdown just for those of you who are new to the concepts of framing. Get a general idea of what we're looking at here, okay? So I'm personally going to stop talking, and I'm going to allow my 2020 self here uh, to walk through some of the key points of framing, and then we're going to move to that next phase of the catcher's warm-up, okay? All four points and corners of the strike zone, okay? Blowing in, up and in, up and out, blowing out. So we're going to talk about body positioning. Body shift, where do I receive the ball and what am I supposed to do with it? Okay, Alex, I'm gonna ask you to jump over there on this one. All right, when we talk framing, you guys, we're gonna give our pitcher the signal or coach is gonna relay that in. And the minute that you make eye contact with your pitcher, you're gonna go ahead and set up, okay? Remember, we talked about how to receive the ball, getting up and ready, getting off of our calves, okay? And now my shoulders are over top of my knees. Now from this position, depending on what pitch I call, whether it's an inside pitch or an outside pitch, I am going to step with that outside leg and transition to the corner. Now, when do I do that? I do that when the pitcher starts her motion, okay? I'm not gonna give the signal and then set up and then she's gonna throw because we're gonna give that pitch away. Instead, once the pitcher has that signal and she starts her motion, I'm going to subtly transition to that corner for the pitch I just called. Here's the thing. You want to get your midline in the middle of that corner. You want that corner right in the middle of your body when you set up. Okay? So I'm going to call that pitch. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and get in my up and ready position. Now, let's say it's an inside pitch. I'm going to step towards that inside corner, and I'm going to shift my weight to that outside hip. Now I'm gonna receive the ball in the midline of my body. So if we talk about an inside pitch, okay, I'm gonna let that pitch travel a little bit before I catch it. So notice, I'm gonna step, shift over, and I'm gonna let the ball travel in the zone. Notice how I have a bent arm. When I receive the pitch, my wrist is under my glove. My elbow's on the outside of my knee, my palm is facing towards the plate, then my fingertips are curved in slightly. Notice how my weight is shifted to the outside hip, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about the outside pitch. Same thing, I'm now gonna step and transition my weight to the outside corner, and I'm gonna shift my weight to my outside hip. See how my midline of my body is straight in line with the outside corner. My chest and my nose are down, but looking back towards the plate. Here's the big difference for the inside pitch versus the outside pitch. Remember how I talked about the inside pitch, we have to let the ball travel. See how I have a relaxed arm, okay? The reason for that is the ball travels faster than you will. If you have to have a steel throw or you have to throw somebody out, okay, you're gonna be quicker pop to pop time if we let that ball travel in the zone. If you reach and have to pull it, it's going to add tenths of seconds to your pop time. And when we're talking about 1.6 seconds at the division one level, every tenth counts. Okay, so inside pitch, when I shift, I transition, I let the ball get deeper in the zone. Outside pitch, I'm now going to go get this pitch. So when I receive the outside pitch, notice how my fingertips are facing the pitcher. My palm is back towards the zone and my nose is looking down over the ball with my chest over the ball and my weight to the outside leg, okay? I'm All right, so one thing I forgot to mention earlier is, you know, there's multiple different ways to accomplish a task, right? Now, some of you are gonna look at that and go, well, what about the thumb up method for framing, okay? There's so many different ways to do things, but when you coach, the biggest thing that you want to understand, and athletes, this is for you too, is you want to understand the why behind what you're doing. Okay. So for example, I just taught, I just explained to you on the inside pitch, 
we allow that pitch to get deep right now you're going to hear some people like to go get that pitch now uh, you know in my career i was never taught that way I never did that doesn't mean it's right or wrong right the reason why I don't teach this one is one, the ball travels faster than you will, but also what if you get a hitter, especially at some of the 14 U, 12 U, 10 U's that has a slow barrel in the zone and you're barred out on that inside corner. Now you're at risk for getting injured and now you're at risk for catcher's interference. Okay. So the biggest thing that I encourage all of you to do is to really ask questions and take the time to understand the, the mechanics and the physiology and the science behind what we're teaching and the movements that you're doing. Uh, for example, you know, framing a big one is going to be that thumb up, right? Now, the reason I don't like personally the thumb up is because I tore my UCL ligament. Um, we play we play a sport that's got a heavy ball. You see that a lot in baseball, right? One of the differences, in, in my opinion, and through my experience and career is we throw a heavy ball and a, and a hard down ball, right? And so if we're trying to frame a drop like this, we're putting a lot of stress there. And I have a pin in my thumb to throw that, that maybe our UCL can't really handle the force that's coming under that pitch, right? So let's get under it and let's let our wrist take the take the brunt of that. When And, I, and we're going to do a Q&A um, after. So if you have notes and you're taking notes, make sure you jot down any questions you have specific to framing. And I'm happy to talk through any of that stuff. When we finish up, okay. Whoops. We're gonna talk about framing. All right. So we talked about the first phase of catcher's warm up, which is going to be framing. Now we're going to move to blocking. All right. So whether you switch with your partner or you're going all the way through the series, now we're going to do five balls in the dirt right at you. And then we're going to go five balls in the dirt to your glove side, five balls in the dirt to your throwing side. Okay. Uh, when you're tossing, if you're a coach or a teammate try and toss the balls right beyond the tip of the plate okay because what we want to really reinforce with our catchers is a kickback all right a kickback is key to taking the energy out of the ball when we block so one of the big things that I, I teach my catchers and they laugh a little bit about is, is how many times do we hear as catchers be a wall back there okay well what happens if I throw a softball as hard as I can against a brick wall what's it going to do it's going to ricochet with that same force away from that wall. Now, what if I throw a ball as hard as I possibly can against a mattress? It's going to deaden it and it's going to drop right in front of them. So I always tell my catchers, be a mattress. You want to take that energy out of the ball when you block it and you want to keep it playable in front of you, right? So the kickback is the best way to do that. So we'll start. I'm going to go ahead and play. Uh, Alex is, is her warm up right now. And so all I'm doing is I'm just tossing short hops, or I'm going to try and toss short hops straight at her so she can work on getting that glove down. The first thing when we block, and you'll hear this next, is the first thing to hit the ground has got to be that glove, chin to chest, see the ball. We're replacing our, uh, our feet with our knees, and we're keeping that ball playable. Once I do five up the middle, then I'm going to work glove side. And Alex is going to do a great job of beating the ball to the spot getting her belly button around the ball and keeping that ball playable in front of her. And the reason that's so important is because we have a runner on base. We want to be ready to make that secondary throw and throw that runner out as base runners. We know that we're looking for that ball in the dirt to take that next base. So for catchers, we want to take pride in owning the bases to make sure that we keep that thing playable in front of us. Okay. So this is step two with the blocking uh, with catchers warm up with our blocking. So five middle, Five balls glove side, five balls throwing side, okay? Alex crushed it. All right, so same thing here. I'm gonna talk a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking and let myself <laughs> uh, teach you a little bit about the kickback for those of you who may be new to blocking or unfamiliar with the mechanics associated with it. So this first one is really working at a ball straight at us. And then the next video is gonna talk a little bit about side to side. Now, one thing I wanna point out is this right here on the floor okay so i call this the upside down t so if you're in the dirt draw that upside down t right here this is where you want your catcher to set up this really comes into play when we move to our glove transfers and i'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to that next phase but this element in my mind is really really crucial as a roadmap for our catcher's footwork hey everyone welcome back to the steel pro series hey in this episode yeah. we're going to talk about our Guess what, guys? I didn't proofread my videos here. All right, I'm going to talk about blocking since I put a glove transfer on that one. Let's see. I wonder if uh, let's play a little game here and see what this video is. Nope, same one. All right, that's my bad. 
Um, all right, so basically when we talk about the kickback, all right, Alex is gonna get in her up and ready position. I'm actually gonna go back to this one and I'm gonna bring you back here. You're gonna notice that Alex gets in her up and ready position and her feet, okay, they're gonna kick back as the ball comes in. The glove is the first thing to turn and to hit the ground and her knees now replace her feet in this cradled position. Okay, you are gonna notice, let's see if I get it to stop right there and boom. All right, you are gonna notice now that Alex has her shoulders over top of the ball, her chin is tucked to her chest, her eyes are looking down at the ground and her elbows are out as far as they can get. We are now gonna smother this ball. And we talked about taking the energy out of it and the best way to do that, up and ready, kick, boom. This is our ideal blocking position. The reason we don't want to fall forward from our up and ready position is because if you think about, let's think about physics, right? You have a heavy object and a lighter object. The heavy object is the catcher. The lighter object is the ball. Okay. Now both of those objects move at each other. What's going to happen to that lighter object? Boom. It's pushing it away. Right? So that's the whole reason we don't want to fall into that ball when it comes at us. We want to make sure that we kick our feet back and we get behind that ball and act like that mattress, which takes the energy out of it, okay? Now let's talk about side to side. I'm trying to move it, there we go. All right, let's talk about side to side. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Catching Academy. We're focusing on the blocking series. Now that we have shown you how to block a ball coming straight at you, we're now gonna work side to side, okay? Here's what we don't do. We don't lean and fall. We don't reach with the glove, okay? The goal with blocking is to get your body behind that ball and get your belly button behind the ball. Always think, beat the ball to the spot, okay? Remember, blocking and catching in general is about anticipation. So if you call a curveball or a screwball, or let's say you've got a drop out or a change up in, you know you're going to have to move your feet a little bit to get your body behind that ball. So let's talk about what this looks like. Okay, now I want you to imagine, and if we were in the dirty, be able to see it, that you've got a line, a half circle drawn out from each toe around the plate, okay? So you've got a semi-circle here coming out around the plate. Now this semi-circle is gonna be really, really important because this kind of serves as a target for where you want to get your body, your knees, your hips, your shoulders. When you block, your ultimate goal is to keep your hips and your shoulders and your belly button facing the plate on both sides, okay? So if I come now to the glove side for righties, when I end up, when I block that ball, I'm gonna make sure that my chest and my hips, everything is facing back towards the plate. The reason for that is because, like we talked about in the blocking straight on the kickback videos, our goal is to get the ball to land and stop somewhere around the plate so we have a play on it, okay? So Alex is gonna walk through what these mechanics look like. So we're gonna start going to our glove side. So Alex is gonna get in the up and ready position. Now, the first thing to hit the ground still has to be the glove, okay? But now here's what's gonna be different from a kickback. Alex is gonna step with the outside leg and she's gonna push hard off the inside leg to get her body and her belly button around the ball. Notice now, go ahead and get down on the ground, kiddo. Notice now that Alex is ending up in the exact same position that she did for a kickback. The only thing that's different is the way she moved her feet. So glove is down, chin to chest, throwing hand behind the ball, elbows out, chest and eyes over the ground, parallel with the ground, smothering that ball. Come back to center, kiddo. Let's walk through the footwork again, because the footwork is really what's different here. Up and ready. She's gonna step with the outside foot and she's gonna push off the inside foot and she's gonna propel herself around the ball. Notice how here where Alex has ended up, her belly button is in front of that ball. Okay, come over here, kiddo. Let's switch sides. So now she's gonna go to the throwing side for a righty. Up and ready, step with the outside, push off the inside, propel her hips, propel her belly button, around that ball. Now come back to center, kiddo. One thing I wanna make sure that we reinforce here is when you step, you make that lateral step, 
You want to stay on the balls of your feet. Trade me spots. Okay. You want to stay on the balls of your feet. So when I make this outside step and I push hard off the inside, if I stay on the balls of my feet and I keep my toes facing forward, I'm going to be able to get around the ball. What I mean by that is I do see a lot of catchers as they start this, they'll kind of open that toe up and they'll get on their heel. Watch what happens when I go to my heel and I open. See how my hips open and my chest opens? Now look what happens. I have to work hard to now get my body around. So make sure that your catchers are staying on the balls of the feet. Okay, heels should stay off the ground. Toes staying straight forward with that lateral step. And now I'm going to push hard off that right leg to get myself around the ball. Same thing's going to happen. Throw inside. I'm going to step, staying on the balls of my feet. I'm going to push hard and propel my body around the ball. So let's go ahead and show them one more time these direction, Alex. We start the left side. We get over here, Oreo. Up and ready. Good. Step. Push. Perfect. She stayed nice and low through that block. You didn't see her come up. You didn't see a lot of daylight underneath. Come on, get back to center, kiddo. Let's go throw inside. Again, stay nice and low. Step the outside, push off the inside, and get around the ball. Notice how Alex's shoulders, her chest, her belly button are facing back towards the ball or back towards the plate. So we now have a return throw or an opportunity at a secondary play. All right. Okay, so that's going to be step two in the catcher's warm up. We've walked, we've talked about our framing. Now we've talked about our blocking. And so notice with our um, our footwork of our framing and our blocking, it's the same, right? So if we stay, if we get in that up and ready position and we call our pitch and we step towards that corner and we're starting to shift with the pitch, great. If it's a strike, we're already in the right position to frame it. If the ball's in the dirt, our body and our momentum is already moving that way. Now we continue to push off that outside leg and we can get behind the ball. So there's consistency there. So what's important about doing this catcher's warm up every day is we're warming up our feet. We're getting our hips warm. We're, we're stretching out. We're getting flexibility in our hips and we're telling our body, Hey, we got to start moving. This is what we're doing. Okay. All right. The third and final aspect of the catcher's warm up, which is one of my favorites. It's going to be our glove transfers. Now, like I mentioned before, there's there's multiple different ways for a glove transfer, right? You're going to see some people teach kind of the Superman elbows out, thumbs down. Uh, personally, I was taught and throughout my career, I was a palm up kid. Okay, I did a palm up transfer. It makes it makes a ton of sense for me. It took a lot of heat off of my shoulder. So my shoulder and my elbow didn't hurt. Um, and it gave me that 12 to six spin when I told you that story where I had side spin before and coach said, no dice, you're, you're going over the top. And so this was the way I was able to accomplish that. So when we go our glove transfers, okay, what we're going to do is your partner is going to toss. We're going to start with five reps back up the middle. Like we're throwing the ball to second base. Again, Alex is using a brand new mini glove right here, training glove, but She's going to go glove transfers like she's going to second. Boom, palm to ear, quick to the top, setting your feet, making sure the instep of that back foot and that glove shoulder are pointed at our target. Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing as we go to first base. So now as we do uh, five to second, we're going to move on and go picks to first. Good. Alex doing a couple more reps in there. Love it. Boom, good. Now, when you're doing your glove transfers, you're going to hear me talk about this here next is the glove is the first thing to move. OK, let that ball get as deep as possible because the ball travels faster than you do. All right. So we're warming up right now. We're getting ready to pick this runner off. Not only are we getting our body warm, but we're getting in that mindset as well. So now we're going to go to third. We're going to do six reps to third. OK, we do three going behind the hitter and then we go three going in front of the hitter. All right. So some of you may think, well, Ash, what's the difference? It's really depending on where the hitter is standing in the box. OK, if that hitter is in the back of the box, you're going to want to create a lane and a pathway to go in front of the hitter. If she is middle or back, or I'm sorry, middle or front of the box, you, <laughs> you can go um, behind that hitter. Right. We don't want to have to pick a fight with that hitter if we don't have to. So ideally, we want to create a throwing lane to throw that runner out. 
All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about glove transfers. Again, there's multiple ways to do this. I teach and I'm very familiar with palm up. So for those of you who are, aren't familiar with a glove transfer, the mechanics associated behind it, behind it, this is what you're gonna hear me talk about here. This is where this piece on the floor really comes into play. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Steel Throw series. Hey, in this episode, we're gonna talk about our glove turn, our glove transition, and where do we take the ball out of our glove? This detail will make or break your steel throw for multiple reasons. Here's the first thing you have to remember. The first thing to move when you receive the ball has to be your glove turn. It's not your feet, it's not your hips, okay? This is a little different than baseball. You'll see some baseball catchers move their feet, then catch the ball, then pull. Keep in mind, they have a lot more distance to work with, and a man's body is, uh, is made anatomically to be stronger than ours, okay? We have a quicker game, we have a faster game, and so we have to be really clean and crisp and pay attention to the detail. So the first thing that's going to move when you receive the ball is going to be turning your palm to your ear. That's her forehead. That's her ear, Okay. Here's the thing you gotta pay attention to. When you receive the ball, and we talk about this a little bit in our, we talk about this a lot in our receiving episodes, is you have to get your wrist underneath your glove so you can push your palm straight to your ear. Look what just happened to my shoulder when I did that. Remember what two things have to be pointed to our target when we throw for an after throw? Boom, okay? Check out what happens if my glove does not, my palm doesn't get to my ear. Or if it comes down here, look where it sits. Okay, if you want to sub two, you want to sub 1.8, you want a 1.6 pop time, you have to get gloves here. So let's talk about transition. Okay, where do you take the ball out of your glove? It has to be at your ear. So we get under the ball, go ahead and get set up. Boom, her wrist is under the ball when she receives it. She gets under the ball, palm to the ear. Now, her glove is facing the catcher because we're going to take the throwing hand and take the ball out of the glove. Alex, go ahead and turn around for me and face the mat down in your stance. Okay, go to the top, palm to ear. Boom, look at this right here. You can see in the back of her glove, look how easy it is for her to reach in and get that ball out of her glove, okay? If she doesn't turn the palm to the ear, she's gotta come around that glove and around herself to get to that throwing motion. Go ahead and turn back around. Remember, 1.6 seconds, when we're talking about tenths of seconds, that adds one or two tenths of a second. Okay, so the first thing to move when you receive the ball is your glove. Where does our glove go? We push the palm up to the ear. We get under the ball, push the palm up versus, look at the difference. This is what not to do, okay? If she receives the ball right here, look at our wrist is the side of the ball. She's now gonna drag the back of her glove, and now she's gonna come around to get the ball. That takes longer. So make sure when you receive it, that your wrist is under the ball so you can now push the palm up to the ear. I see a lot of catchers who make the transition at the shoulder right here. Look where her shoulder is pointing now towards their face. She's not gonna get her body turned all the way for an accurate throw, and guess what? If she takes the ball out of, out of her glove here, she's not gonna work to get all the way up here. She's gonna force that throw from this position. Now we've lost power, we've lost accuracy. Guess what's gonna start to hurt when you throw from that position, your elbow, okay? So, first things first, palm to ear, boom, this position, now what do my feet do? So now we're on our T line. The first thing that is going to turn is we are going to pick up the right foot if you're a righty, left foot if you're a lefty, and we're gonna put that in step right on that intersection of your power line and your upside down T. All right, kiddo, go ahead and go to the top, palm to ear, good. Step right, turn the right foot, good. And step on that power line, beautiful. What two things have to be pointed to our target? Look how Alex is throwing shoulders at her target. Look at the instep of her back foot's at the target and her toes are parallel on her power line. Now she's ready to throw. She's got her palm in her ear, okay? She's got that ball facing away from her and her elbow's as high as her shoulder, okay? We'll talk about in the next series what we do from this position. Go back down. 
But this is really important position for, for catchers for throwing anything we do. If it's bump throws, if it's recovery throws, if it's steel throws. All right, go up and ready. And palm to the ear, pick up and turn the right foot. Beautiful. Now go back down, kiddo. We're going to do it again. And I want you to watch the right foot. It's really, really important. Go ahead, Miss Alex, up and ready. And slow motion, turn. Look how she picks it up and turns it. She did not turn and pivot. Okay, she picked it up, turned the instep versus doing the pivot. When you pivot, okay, if you don't get that instep turned all the way, a little bit slow when we lose power. So make sure your athletes are picking up that right foot. It's always going to be when you throw, right, left, throw for righties, left, right, throw for lefties. Okay, up and ready. And palm to the ear, right, left, boom, back down. Okay, so essentially now you're going to do that. Your, your partner is going to toss five reps. You're going to go to second, five reps, picks to first, and then you're going to move to third. This is your compass, okay? These lines are really, really important because these power lines for catchers, very, very similar to what we do with pitchers. If you get your toes on those power lines and you get the instep turned to your target and you're striding to your target, you're setting your body up in a great position to have an accurate throw. If Alex were to leave her right foot over here, odds are very good this left foot is going to step wide. Okay, so now our feet are at this angle. She's throwing to second base. Her arm's going to come out at a diagonal slot, and now we're going to have side spin. We're going to lose power, and we may not have an accurate throw. So this is really, really crucial um, for building those quality, that quality muscle memory as we go through in those little skills. All right, so let's recap here a little bit. Catchers warm up. This is going to be our dailies for our catchers. All right, you do your dynamic warm up. You play long toss. You partner up with your catcher, and you're going to toss to each other. You're going to toss five squares. You're going to work a drop in, a drop out, out a rise out and a rise in. You're going to go through that five times, really working on moving your feet, shifting your hips subtly to get behind the ball and commanding the ball. Stick that pitch when you receive it. No floppy gloves. Okay. Once you do that, you're going to move to blocking. You're going to go five straight at you with kickbacks. You're going to go five glove side. You're going to go five throwing side, it's working to stay on that horseshoe that comes out, extends around the plate from your toes to make sure we're beating the ball to the spot. We're seeing it all the way in moving our feet and ultimately taking the energy out of that ball. So we keep it in front of us playable. We're then going to move to glove transfers. Okay. You're going to draw that upside down T line. We're going to do five of our transfer. However you transfer, whether it's elbows out, thumbs down, whether you're palm up, reinforce your mechanics. You have to do the little things daily, right? So you're going to go five to second. You're going to go five picks to first, and then you're going to go six to third three working in front of the hitter, three working behind the hitter. I know we haven't talked a whole lot about that today. Uh, that's moving into a whole nother episode there. Um, again, consistency is going to be the key, right? You want to develop these skills to where they are muscle memory and habit. And you don't really have to think about it now when you're in game time, your body knows what to do. It knows how to react. All right. So that that's what I've got for you today. As far as the catchers warm up. Now, I know I hit you with a fire hose of instructional stuff, and I'm, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions, which I'm super excited to answer for you. Here is my contact information. Here's my email address. This is my little one, my seven year old. She's fallen in love with the position here. Um, do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or you want some further explanation on things. Uh, Colorado Softball Academy is getting ready to launch our video on demand drill library, our app next week. So if anything here that you learned something or you want to learn more, we've got, we're going to have pitching drills, fielding drills, outfielding. Everyone who is putting together a drill at CSA has played the game at the division one level. Um, Shelby Babcock is our director of pitching. She's going to have pitching drills. She pitched at Arizona. Sophie Frost pitched at Cal State Fullerton. She's going to go through her pitching instruction. Riley Plogger played at Utah State. She's one of the best outfielders I've seen and slappers. Chris Hutton, Taylor Hutton. I mean, we've got such an incredible group that is going to get ready to put together this video on demand library. So if you are craving more knowledge like you received today, shoot me an email, let me know, and I'll make sure that I can send you that info once everything is launched in live. All right, Jess, that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Yeah, uh, so if anyone has any questions for Ashley, just feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I know we have one in the Q&A right now. So um, feel yeah. free. We have probably another 15 minutes or so. So fire away. 
Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, those of you who have made notes, if you just do me a favor and just shoot me a quick email. So I have your name and email address in my inbox. That would be amazing. Here is my email address. Uh, make sure I type it correctly. Hey, rally at cosoftballacademy.com. Yeah. So shoot me just a quick email. So I've got your info in my inbox and I'll make sure that I, uh, I will put you on a list. And once we launch that app, I'll make sure that you have all that information. So you have access to that. Okay. All right. Hit me with questions. There's no way nobody has any questions about this. <laughs> There are questions, okay, there are coaches asking catchers to frame by not moving their body and catching the ball, bring it back in. Yeah, uh, so really great question. Now, let's talk about this concept of framing. What are we trying to do is we are trying to create uh, a perception for the umpire, right? So what he is asking is catchers don't move your body. We're gonna catch it here and we're gonna pull it into the zone. Now, if you're an umpire and the first thing and you see that catcher's glove move, what is the first thing that you're gonna think? It was out of the zone, right? It's all about perception. However, if we can set up our body, right? And we can receive the ball in the manner without moving our glove and dragging it in, but we're painting a picture for the umpire saying, hey, this ball is right here, right? So not here, but now we catch it here, the ball's in the same spot, but it's the way in which we position our body and receive it that makes it look more like a strike, okay? Um, so that, a great question, Mike. I am not a huge fan of the stick because when I, it's, it's all about perception. Like I said, if you catch it here and pull it to me and in my experience, that's telling the umpire, Hey, you had to pull it into zone. So it must be out. But if I can position myself when I receive it, so it looks like it's in it, we're going to have a better shot for a call. Hope that makes sense. Great question. All right. Who else has one? Uh, we have, can you see the chat box, the Q and A chat I, box or no? Uh, I can, I can. Did I miss it? Oh, one? okay. Um, I can read them to you or. Yeah, that'd be great. Go for it. Sure. Um, so uh, the next question is what stretches are good to get flexible hips? Oh, good such one. a great question. Um, I'm a big fan of crossover symmetry. If, if you're not familiar with them, I'm just going to type this in here. I, you should Google their stuff. So it's band work uh, symmetry. Um, they've got upper body. So basically what I make my catchers do when they come in for training is they've got a series. It was designed by former baseball players for injury prevention work. So we do upper body stuff, but then they have what they call these hip halos and it's a loop, but it's a resistance band. And you step into that and you put it around just above your knees. And what that is working is you go through a series of drills that activate the muscles in your core. And that's going to help with your flexibility because we're doing everything from side to side. We're doing everything with squats, but what we're really working is proper activation of the muscles surrounding your knees in your glutes, your hammies and your core. So that's the first thing that you should do. Honestly, yoga is incredible for catchers. Um, anything where you sit on the ground and I wish I could show you, but you put, so if you sit flat on your back, okay. And you put both legs straight out, and let's say you pull your left leg, you pull your he heel in towards your, your glute and your knee is bent. Now take your right ankle and put it right on that knee and you're gonna make a figure four. You're gonna start to open those hips up, okay? Little things like that, uh, hip flexor stretches. Um, anything that's gonna hit the fronts, the sides, your glutes, hammy and your core. It, and your, as, well, as well as your lower back is going to work that flexibility. But that is a wonderful question. Anything yoga related, honestly, is amazing for catchers. Uh, next one. What do you think are the biggest benefits of catching with wrist instead of thumb under ball? Mm, great question. You have more control um, and stability when you get underneath that ball. So think about the the movements and the mechanics associated with a drop ball. Okay. You've got something coming in with a really hard bite. So now I'm going to get my wrist under it. So that's going to take the blow because that's a stronger joint versus doing this. This is not a natural comfortable position and think about what we're asking this one to do. Right. So I can show, I don't know if you guys can see this. I've got a sweet scar right here where I had to have a pin put in my thumb because essentially what happened is it was supposed to be a drop out. 
and she missed her spot and I went and recovered. And the way that I received the ball put all the heat right here on my thumb and I tore that UCL. So they call it gamekeeper's thumb. And I had to have a, a surgery and put a pin put in it. So instead of putting the pressure here, let's put the pressure here. The other thing that I like about that is it allows us, if, if you get set up in your stance and we're talking a drop on the inside corner or a change up on the inside corner and that ball is low in the zone, if I drop my left knee in and I've got my elbow on the outside of my knee, now I can push my shoulder and my wrist under the ball and start to steal more strikes because there's going to be a point that you can only go so low here before you're handcuffed and you can't get underneath it. So those are the advantages that, that I teach. Good question. Um, we have, we have a question about if you offer clinics and camps during the summer. Yes, we do. So coloradosoftballacademy.com is our website. If you're on social media, make sure you follow our Facebook page and our Instagram, because that's where you're really going to see all of our camp info. For those of you who come out to Colorado for sparkler or fireworks tournaments, we're going to put some events on during those. So if you follow those pages and also if you, uh, when you send me your email addresses, I'll make sure that we add you to our mailing list so you can stay up to date on the events that we're going to have in the summertime. Great question. Um, any recommendations for catchers with minor knee injuries like stretching drills? Yes. Dewey, can you give me a little more information on the knee injury? Because I'll give you, uh, I've had seven knee surgeries. Mine are kneecap related. Um, my ACLs are thicker than, than anyone's ever seen, but I, when I was in middle school, I actually started subluxing my kneecaps and they would, they would go out and then they would pop back in and it actually started in basketball. And I'm seeing a lot of this in young athletes because it's a result of one, the way that anatomically females are made because we have a wider hip angle, but our VMO, your VMO is the inside quad muscle. So it's your quad muscle on the inside part of your knee. And inherently, if we don't train our quads and work injury prevention, the VMO is not strong enough to counter the force of our, our lateral quad, that quad on the outside, our lateral, it's called the um, vastus lateralis, right? So your quad, you have a big muscle on the outside, you got a big muscle on the inside, right? And when that quad fires, if, you're, if that muscle on the inside isn't strong enough to counter the force from the outside muscle, it's going to pull that kneecap out, okay? So the crossover symmetry, the activation, and no, I'm not sponsored by them. That'd be cool. I just really believe in that system for what they do from an injury prevention and activation and a flexibility, but also little things like straight leg lifts where you have got to engage the quad, right? Then you can add some resistance to that. Leg extension, hamstring curls, a ton of core work. So minor knee injuries, flexibility is going to be your biggest friend. Get into some yoga and then PT like exercises when it comes to hamstring curls, leg extensions, leg lifts, anything that's moving side to side. You can put a band around your ankles and take side steps to work that glute medialis, which is the side of your hip. Uh, anything core related is going to be amazing to help take some pressure off of your hips and knees. I could go all day on that. <laughs> um, another one that we have is when shifting on an outside pitch, should the catcher stay square to the pitcher or angle into the plate? So ultimately you want to ensure that your belly button comes back in towards the plate slightly. Okay. So let's think about again, framing perception. A lot of this is about the angle of our shoulders. Okay. So if I catch a pitch like this, sorry, I'm really close to the computer here. If I'm facing the pitcher, and now I've got this, this is a weird, uncomfortable angle, right? But as I shift, if I angle my belly button slightly towards the plate, I'm now going to be able to get my midline and my nose behind that ball. So it doesn't look so awkward here. So think nose behind the ball, everything angled back towards the plate. Another one we have is, do you have any drills to make throws faster? Mm, yes. It's a lot of it. Well, my goodness, there's so many drills, but the first thing you've got to look at is throwing mechanics. So what I would encourage you to do, whomever just asked that question, make sure you send me an email. So I have your email address and I can let you know when that video on demand library comes out, because the first thing you want to look at is throwing mechanics. All right. There's a lot we talk about with the transition 
But now once we're transferred, okay, well, what do we do for power? And there's so much that goes into leg drive and glove pull and follow through to make sure that one, our throwing mechanics are clean and concise. That's step one. And then we can start working drills to make sure that our hands are quicker. Our velocity goes up, our leg drive, we're getting power in our legs. We, we use resistance bands a lot. We use med balls a lot. We use tennis balls a lot. So um, yeah, make sure you shoot me that email because there's so much I can just pour into you from a drill perspective, but really making sure those throwing mechanics are clean is gonna be your first step. Um, what do you think of the catcher's glove positioning um, where you do the L setup? Uh, the L setup would give me some more information if you can. Are you talking like one knee on the ground? Is that what we're talking about? Where you're starting with one knee on the ground here? Let me know if I was with David. So if David, if you want to pop some more information in the the chat box. I just want to make sure I'm answering actually what you're asking. Um, the next one, um, while um, he's typing that out, how do mm -hmm. you feel about throwing from your knees? Mm, oh, I love it. Absolutely. Um, so the catcher's warm up was all from the feet, right? We, throwing from your feet is, is going to be, I think, and, and it was for me harder than throwing from your knees. So you're gonna be faster when you throw from your knees. I threw a one five, uh, what did I throw? A one five six from my knees and I threw a one six from my feet. So that was always my go-to. Now, here is my rule with my catchers is you're not allowed to throw from your knees until you show me consistency and accuracy from your feet first. And a lot of times this is my kiddos that are 10 U, 12 U. They're like, I want to throw from my knees, Ash. And I say, great, well, let's show me some consistency and some good power and accuracy throwing from your feet. And then we'll work on that piece, right? Throwing from your knees is so much fun and it's so valuable. And nine times out of 10, you're going to be faster when you throw from your knees, but you've got to make sure that you develop that solid foundation from your feet, right? Once you develop both of those, we talk about, okay, when do I do one or the other? And it's all really reliant on what pitch you called. So for me, drop ball, change up, curve ball. I was going from my knees. So I was thinking a pitch ahead. I knew if I had a fast runner on first and I called a curve that I was going from my knees. Now curve ball is going to be really um, individual to comfort level of each catcher rise balls and screw balls. I went from my feet because I knew they might have a tail on them and I'd have to go up and get that pitch. So absolutely throw from your knees after you've established that solid foundation from your feet. Do you recommend any exercises for arm strength? I'm going to go back to, to crossover symmetry. Um, so there's a lot of resistance band work that you can do that starting with uh, your lats, your deltoids. I mean, anything that's really going to encompass the shoulder capsule itself, working down into your back, as long as you get those activation series moving, those little things with resistance bands are huge. You can even get a TheraBand. You can order them off of Amazon if you Google TheraBand and get a carabiner and tie a knot to that carabiner and hook it to the fence, there's gonna be a ton of drills that you can do, one for injury prevention that also helps strengthening. Long toss is huge for building arm strength uh, and overhand throwing velocity. Throwing mechanics are key. And then once, once you're there, hit the weight room. And that's where you're gonna to start to see that go up. Do you think that catchers should drop a knee when catching or should it depend on the situation? Good question. Uh, I think it's situational. So the biggest thing with this is you never want to drop to a knee. I, I, I don't love setting. I don't love it when catchers set up on a knee, because what if the pitcher misses? What are you going to do? Runner on base? Absolutely not. Right. So it's going to be situational. Now you have a pitcher that's money with hitting her locations, with hitting her spots, and you get a drop in and you want to cheat a little bit without a runner on base and you want to set up a little bit lower. Yes. Uh, I always dropped my left knee in on my low and my low and in pitches and my changeups because it helped me get low and under the ball. But it's really going to be situational. I don't necessarily teach it. Um, I don't teach it from a setup perspective because I want you to be able to move your feet. I need you to be able to get around that ball. If it's in the dirt at the younger ages, our pitchers are the, the consistency and accuracy. They're not going to hit their spots as much as a college, as college catcher would. Right. I mean, if you've got a, a I'm sorry, a college pitcher, you got a college pitcher at a power five school, they're going to hit their spots majority nine times out of 10, right. If not 10 out of 10. 
we're talking 14 you 16 you even at the 18 you level i mean i'm watching some of our 18 teams and and our catchers are getting crossed up right and left so if you're starting down there you've just handcuffed your yourself to be able to actually move and steal that pitch and get around that pitch if it's in the dirt but great question any tips on making pop time faster when throwing to second or third mm -hmm. it's all in that glove transfer all in that glove transfer. That's the that's the secret sauce right there. So that catcher's warm up we just talked about, cleaning that release up and pull, that is going to be your your pop time is in your glove transfer. How fast can you get the ball in and out of your glove? Um, is there a website or something of that nature that can teach catchers to call pitches? Ooh, awesome. That will be in our video on demand library. We're going to talk through leadership. We're going to talk through strategies of calling pitches, what to look for, knowing your pitcher, working with your pitcher. That's going to be in that video on demand library. Um, you know, I'm sure you can jump on and do some research with it. If you just do a simple Google or you jump on YouTube, there's probably some information out there. Um, but that's a really, really great question. A lot of how to call pitches is, is, in my mind have been uh, been back there and understanding, all right, where's the pitcher in the box or where's the hitter in the box? Where are her feet? Where is she set up? Where are her hands? What's her barrel doing? Watching her warm up swings, knowing my pitcher, knowing her strengths. What is her best pitch? Um, what is her go-to pitch? What does her change up and off speed look like? What is the situation? What is the score, right? There's a lot that's gonna go into that. Where Where's my defense set up? What are we trying to get out of this play? So there's a lot that goes into that. But absolutely, um, we will have info on that. Cool. And then last one, going back to David's question. Uh, so it was, what do you think of the catcher's glove positioning where you do the L setup, thumb and pointer finger? Mm, yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. Again, that's going to be more thumb under the ball. So I was always a big proponent of wrist under the ball. So not necessarily here, right? I'm going to put more heat here to get under that pitch. And then if I'm going outside pitch, I'm getting around that with the fingertips towards the pitcher. Um, so the L setup with your pointer finger and your thumb is gonna really be that framing technique of coming this way underneath that. Not something that, that I fell in love with, doesn't mean it doesn't work. Um, I just had more success and I was much more comfortable getting my wrist underneath that ball, just so I had more control, especially when that ball's spinning. And then I know I said last question, but this is also a good one. Um, what age do you recommend a player begin weight training outside of scheduled practices? Ah, really, really good question. This is a this is a hot topic. Um, so there's a difference in functional fitness movements, okay, that strengthen the little stabilizer muscles around your joints and in your core and work overall athleticism, which are huge. And then there's the aspect of adding weights, okay. My six-year-old right now loves our weight room. She's in with Coach LP at, at when she's in the academy, and she's doing box jumps, and she's uh, push-ups with bands underneath her belly or trying pull-ups, right? I don't think there's ever a too young age for body weight functional fitness or resistance band movements, but when you come to adding weights, it's got to be post-puberty to be honest. And that's really individual to each kid, but it's got to be post puberty because you've got to let those joints and those growth plates get a little bit further developed and down the line before you start adding really heavy resistance, especially overhead. This is a no-go at the younger ages. I, I don't really advocate for Olympic lifts, to be honest. Um, we never did Olympic lifts at the University of Florida. I mean, we obviously, we did our cleans, we did front squat, back squat, but we never did anything where we were a snatch and a jerk pushing that way. That was, that was not something that was going to be healthy for us. So uh, to go back, answer your question, there's never too young of an age to work functional fitness and body weight movements, push-ups, pull-ups, running mechanics, box jumps, all that fun stuff. I mean, my six-year-old loves it, eats it up. Resistance bands are good. I would say from eight definitely all the way through puberty. And then after puberty, you can start adding weights to bars and, and doing that kind of free weight stuff. Awesome question. Yeah, that was a good one. I had to end with that one because I was like, that's a really good question. That's a good one. That's a good one. And if um, you have more, you've got my email address. Don't hesitate to reach out. I mean, this is, this is the stuff we just want to be able to pour, pour into everybody to help grow this game. Good. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight, everybody. I'm, I'm honored to be able to spend this moment with you.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Absolutely. Have a great night.